We have two more sessions that we're going to do in this series. And remember me saying it took, took the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the, the old charismatic or Pentecostal side of things right here is to begin to deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But how many know that uh, there has to be some things in place before that can happen and happen right? You see, several things that are a, a quandary to me that any pastor, and, and how many know, I, I don't care if you're a, uh, wherever you pastor, whatever day you meet, how many know that pastors have their hands full? Blessed are little hearts. They got their hands full. Because things aren't really right in the church. I don't care if they're a Sabbath keeper. How many know that, that uh, rabbis and us that keep the Sabbath, we even have lots of problems in, in the congregation. And, and pastors that meet on Sunday have, it's, it's, it's kind of universal, isn't it? And one of the reasons is that we've not allowed the real ministry of the Holy Spirit to begin dealing in our lives the way that we should. We've not realized that when I don't allow him to deal in my life, it doesn't just affect me. It, can, it affects my children. It affects everybody around me. In other words, if I don't deal, everybody around me has to pay the price. And uh, we heard a prominent minister on, on television this week, and bless his heart, he said, he goes, he goes, sometimes he said, you know, Christians are dangerous. He said, I've had people just get up and say, the Lord has called me in the, to come help you in your ministry. And so they pack up and move all the way across the country to his ministry. And then when they don't end up with a big paycheck, they try to destroy the ministry. Let me tell you something, that happens more times than not. That... Uh, God never caused a schism in a church, but the flesh and undealt with things because people won't allow the Holy Spirit to deal with things. And then you go into the charismatic side of things, and we put a spooky edge to it. We call it the Holy Spirit. No, it's not. Ninety percent of what's being done in churches today is either carnal flesh, immaturity, or another spirit. And I, I want to deal with some of that. And, and it's interesting how that when God begins to show you things, how that God begins to put things in your, in, in, in your path so that you can kind of uh, see that Mary discovered a, uh, a YouTube video. She gets on there and she finds stuff I couldn't find if I wanted to. She, just, and she doesn't really mess with computers that much, so you know it has to be the Holy Ghost, okay? <laughs> and uh, the guy's name was Roger Montague or Montague or... Moreau or something like that. Big, it's it's in, uh, in French, so it's, but he's from Montreal. And he was dealing how that uh, back in 1944 after World War II that he was recruited by the Illuminati and brought into their ranks. And he begins to explain all of, of how he was brought in. And, and uh, they worship all the fallen angels. And uh, they begin to spell out, he said they, they, they had a council in the 1700s that Lucifer brought in all the, fallen, all the fallen angels, the chief ones, and had a council, what do we need to do to get the earth to where we want it? Because what they believe is that when this whole thing is finished, this great conflict is finished, that Jesus is going to, there, there's not going to be a millennial reign. They believe that Jesus is going to relinquish any claim to the earth, take his out of it, and then Lucifer is going to resurrect all those who followed him, and he's going to reign on this earth forever. That, that's literally what they're, they're doing. And, and so they, they say, we have got to get this accomplished. We have got to deceive the body of Christ. And they, they be, remember me talking about in, in this series about how the Holy Spirit's here to mentor you, that God wants to mentor you, that you receive knowledge from what mentors you. He said that, and he began to talk about how these spirits would do this with the people in, in, their, in their order. And uh, how he even, he even shared that how the, this plan in the 1700s came to pass, and Lucifer himself went and mentored a guy named Darwin that came up with evolution. Because it was essential to their plan of deceiving the masses. And some of the things he talked about he said, that was told him in 1944, you can begin seeing how things begin to, over, over those decades, how they begin to set all those, the plan into motion. And he, he shared in Montreal, I mean, there was, this thing was in a mansion where they met. And all the power players in Canada would come. Because these spirits would put them in prominence and... And he also shared how that there was a price to be paid if he ever went against them. And this one family had built a home in, in, in that time, uh, was fireproof, supposedly, and they tried to leave the order, and the, that thing burnt to the ground with them in it, in a fireproof house. And so he, he saw power. 
But what was interesting in the midst of this and, and, and all the deceptions, and they had what they called the super deception, which was the New Age movement before it even started back in 1944. They also talked about deceiving the body. And part of the thing of deceiving the body, and I'll, I'll just let you kind of take this and run with it the way that you want to. He said it was, it was paramount to enforce Sunday reverence. Now, this was in 44, before there was something called blue light laws. Remember the blue light laws that used to be? He said that they're going to cause laws to be passed that everyone must reverence Sunday. And he said, he said, since that is Lucifer's day, no matter where you meet, no matter what you do, even if you're supposed to be meeting in a, a Christian church, according to them, that Lucifer receives homage from it, and it opens them up to deception. And he said the only groups that they, they couldn't really mess with were those that were Sabbath keepers. And uh, I kind of thought that interesting because we know that Sunday worship and a lot of the things that we're trying to expunge out of our expression of God all come from Rome. And Rome, as long as you are a Sunday worshiper, they consider you a Catholic that has strayed away, that will one day return to the fold. The minute that you stop doing Sunday worship and begin worshiping on Saturday, they say you're anathema. You're no longer a Roman Catholic. And so there, there's some things that, that I can, I, I don't know about you, but I want to get rid of the deception. I don't want to have other spirits coming and mentoring my flesh to cause everybody else problems. I need the Holy Spirit. And so really what I want to get into this morning is the Holy Spirit 101. You see, if you know what the Holy Spirit's about, you know what he's supposed to do, and you get the basics of it, then a lot of the things that are happening in various parts of the body it begins to show what they really are if you understand a person. How many of us over in our lifetime have, have heard somebody say something about a dear friend or somebody that we really knew intimately, and you knew by what they were saying, that guy did not do that? That, 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 didn't get, that does not go with his character. E either somebody slipped him a mickey or he got on drugs and I don't know about because that is totally against the character of what this person is. I have known them my whole life. It's the same way with the Holy Spirit. When you understand what the Holy Spirit is about and how he manifests himself and how he expresses himself, you begin to find out a lot of what is being called the Holy Spirit today is pagan mysticism because it doesn't fit with his character. And an and easy way, just, now this, how many have ever read through the Gospels? You kind of got a handle on how Jesus does things. If Jesus wouldn't tolerate it in his presence then, he wouldn't tolerate it in the presence of his spirit now. That's simple. But we have so many things going on. We even have movements that are, that are developed and expand out of extra biblical manifestations of another spirit. The devil doesn't care if you call him the Holy Spirit. He doesn't care if you call him little penny wearing a pink tutu as long as you don't follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't care what you call him. In, in, in Luciferianism, he is called the God of many names. He doesn't care just as long as you don't call on the name of the Lord. One of the things God stressed to me this week over and over again, he cannot empower that which he cannot mature. How many know the power of God is a little, probably a little more powerful than a loaded shotgun? These grandbabies I got back here, the last thing you want to do is hand them a loaded weapon. Why? They're not mature enough to handle the power. Now, how many know if somebody wanted to destroy their family, you'd go give a kid a shotgun? Wouldn't you? So the devil comes in and brings another power to those that are in bondage, are in error, or immature, and what happens? You start seeing this whole trail of destruction behind them and them calling it God. It's not. Jesus didn't leave a path of destruction. He left a path of wholeness. And when the Holy Spirit moved, he does the same thing. I want us this morning to go to John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, then we'll jump over to John 16. But this is the ministries of the Holy Spirit 101. Because we, we have people trying to do calculus in the spirit and they can't even count yet. Then you end up with funny math in the kingdom. It doesn't work. 
Now we need to understand by about John 15, the majority of the ministry of Jesus is over. He knows that the cross is coming at him like a freight train. I mean, he can already see the headlights coming down the track. He already, and so he is, this is right before his great high priestly prayer of, of John 17, and he's beginning to prepare them that they're not going to physically have him with them like they have had for three and a half years. And so he begins to introduce this in John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from my Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye shall also bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now, I want you to see the kind of, I'm getting ready to send a Comforter, that he's, he is the Spirit of truth. Well, they already understand truth because they've been hearing it come from the lips of Jesus for three and a half years. And he's going to testify of me, but at the same time, now that you have been, been intimate with me physically, you, you, you've hung around me, you've been with me 24-7 for three and a half years, and when that comforter comes, you can testify of him because you know me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now let's jump over to John chapter 16. Verses 17, or 7 through 15. Now, these are guys that are starting to freak out because Jesus is getting ready to physically leave them. How many know that if, I mean, they're, in their minds, he's supposed to set up and rule and reign. They're wanting him to do what we see at the book, at the end of the book of Revelation. They're wanting him to do it now. And that's kind of what they, they thought. They're, they're, they're waiting. I mean, even uh, John and James had their mama come and, and ask Jesus, you know, can they sit on either side of your throne? How many, though, they were expecting him to establish a throne in Jerusalem and begin to rule and reign and begin to see what we see in, in the prophets in Isaiah where it said that when, when the Messiah comes that the Torah is going to flow like a river from, from Jerusalem and, and all the world. I mean, they're ready for this to happen. Yeah. We're, I mean, being under Roman rule stinks like fish on ice. I don't want it anymore. I want, oh, God, I want you to come and rule. And Jesus is proven, not yet, we, we still got a job to do, and, and you're waiting for me to begin ruling and reigning, and I'm getting ready to leave, and you're getting ready to get freaked out really bad. But look, he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is that it is expedient for you to go, that, for you that I go away, for if I not go, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. He said, I'm going to take this up another level. You've been physically with me for three and a half years, but, you know, if you're on one side of town, I go over on the other side of town, I'm not with you. I'm getting ready to take this thing up to another level that I'm getting ready to move on the inside of you, that I'm getting ready to live with you. So it's expedient for this to happen to you. But look what he says, what happens. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I say, or said I, he shall take of mine, and shall show it to you. Now he's, he's, he's trying to express some things. How many know that, that Jesus really had taken them about as far as he could take them without the new birth? I've had some people say, well, you know, it was after the Holy Spirit was given, we can get all this mystical stuff now. That's not what that's talking about. He's saying there's only cer certain things that you, can, that you can receive now, but after the new birth, after you're born again, after I go ahead and I pay the price on the cross, and I resurrect victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And when he did that, the Bible says he breathed them and it said, receive the Spirit. Those disciples were born again right then. They didn't wait for the day of Pentecost. They were born again right then because it was the same God that stood and breathed into a piece of clay and Adam was formed, that now that same God is breathing his Spirit into them right there and they were born again and then the Spirit of God was given on the day of Pentecost in a fresh and real way 
to help them walk out the new creation. It wasn't different than what he was doing. It was what he was doing. You see, they could, they could almost get like Jesus. They could, they could almost do these works that Jesus was doing, but yet there were times they couldn't. We see that in the Gospels. There were, there were times they stumbled, and they fell, and they're learning, and he's taking them through this whole process, and he's saying, listen, guys, I have taken you as far as I can take you because your spirit is still dark. But when... when, when the Holy Spirit is given is as after. See, the Holy Spirit wasn't first given on the day of Pentecost. It was given by a resurrected Messiah who breathed his spirit into them. You see, we, we don't get in the, in the, in the Pentecost move, well, I'm going to get the Holy Ghost. Well, you get the Holy Ghost at salvation. He doesn't come in, he comes upon. Well, he won't come upon that which he's not in. And this is one of the things that God spoke to me this morning as we were, we were singing. A lot of people have trouble getting the true baptism of the Holy Spirit because I think there are a lot of people running around speaking in tongues that don't have the, Holy, that don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They don't because there's no fruit. That word baptismo means to be overcome. It's like throwing something into a river. We were saying, you know, Lord, I, uh, I want to be carried away. I want to get in that river. The only way to get caught up in the river is to surrender to the river. The only way, the, the Holy Spirit is not going to baptize something that won't surrender to him. That's right. And I know a lot of people that claim to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the only thing they have surrendered to is their flesh. Because they don't understand who the Holy Spirit is. He said, he said this comforter now in the, in the Greek, this is parakletos which means summoned, called alongside, uh, called to, to one's aid, to plead one case, uh, uh, or to plead one's, uh, to one who pleads another's cause before a judge. Uh, he goes on to, to share how that uh, the, the Holy Spirit destined to take the place of Christ with the apostles after his ascension to the Father to lead them to deeper knowledge of the gospel truth and to give them divine strength needed to enable them to undergo trials and persecution on behalf of the divine kingdom. And so he was saying, listen, oh, we, 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 need, to, we need to put this... When, when Most Christians, when they hear the word comforter, they hear warm fuzzies. And so... You know, if God's doing something, then you've got to have these warm fuzzies. Well, I just don't have peace with that. I don't have that warm fuzzy. But we've got, we got to take back what the Holy Spirit is doing. He said, another comforter, another one just like me. In fact, Jesus, um, let's see, I'm, I'm, let me, let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But I, I want to set our minds this, this forget all the pseudo-psycho-spiritual stuff that's going on in the body of Christ right now. Forget all that, and let's go back to the setting of Jesus. He was the first comforter because he said another comforter, another one called alongside. That Jesus called them to himself. He began to instruct them. He began to teach them. He began to show them, forget how everybody else said things need to be done in the kingdom. This is the way that you do it. There were times that he rebuked them. Now, how many get a warm fuzzy out of rebuke? He corrected them. There were times that he commissioned them and sent them forth with power in his name. But, you know, you, he, they didn't do that until they, after they had to sit with him for a while to get instructed and for him to deal with their issues. But see, when you were around him, he moved in authority that he would not allow another kingdom to function around him, nor would he allow it to function underneath you. Because one time he turned around to Peter and said, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. How many know that that is not a warm fuzzy at all? But what he did, they knew that if they were in his presence, things would never get out of control. That, that even they saw the ones that wanted to kill him had to yield to his authority, and they were comforted in the authority, in the teaching, and in the protection. Not a warm fuzzy, but knowing that if I get out of line, he loves me enough to correct me and bring me back where I need to be, and he's trying to take me line upon line and precept upon precept where I need to be. That was part of the safety that was with Jesus. 
he took a, a, this ragtag group of, of most unlikelies, didn't he, when you look at all of them. Most, a, a fisherman that spent most of his time, he, he had an anger problem, and most of the time he kept his foot in his mouth. You had two brothers, all they were worried about is what side of the throne that they were going to get to rule off of the whole time they were in ministry. And then was so timid about it, they sent their mama to go ask him. And so I, mean, he, so, I mean, he's trying to rein them under control, you know. They're wanting to call fire down on, you know, on Samaria. And he said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Just chill out, sons of thunder, you know. Chill. And he's working this whole time. He's keeping them safe. He's keeping everybody around them safe. Hebraically, that's what you call comfort. You see, when you have righteous rule over you that won't tolerate sin and promotes righteousness, it's a comfort. If we were in a nation that all the politicians did righteousness, that all the cops did righteousness, they could not be bribed. If our judges could not be bribed but walked in righteousness, we would have a nation that would prosper and be comforted. How many know that goes well beyond a warm fuzzy? That's what Jesus was talking about. He, he said this, this disciplined life of learning how to crucify the flesh and walk in the kingdom and flow the way the Father wants you to flow. This comfort that I've given you. But when, when you have seen people come against what we were doing and they had, they had to, to bow the knee to the will of God, that kind of comfort the Holy Spirit's going to bring you. You know what? I don't see any kind of comfort like that in most churches. I don't care what the size. And I see poor pastors. I mean, let me tell you something. Now, Mary and I will, will tell you, there, how many know that there, there's just a lot of things we don't do at biblical life? And you know one of the reasons? It's not because we're honorary, it's because we had enough. We've had enough. Pastors get chewed on, they get stomped on, they get spit out. They have people say, oh, the, God told me to do this this week, then next week. Oh, no, 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 God told me to do that. And if you don't pat them on their little heads, they'll rend you. Yeah. None of them are being led by the Holy Spirit. They're being led by the flesh. They're being led by their own wounds that they won't deal with. And so everybody else has got to, and, and they, they'll even go from church to church trying to find a church that matches their wounds yeah. instead of truth. They look for something to match what their flesh wants to do. I have seen people come in, not only this ministry, but other ministries. Guys, I, when I go out of here, I minister to ministers. I, I can talk about them things I can't talk, to, talk with you about because it, 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 it just absolutely floor you. That I, I, one of the men, and I mean... Brother Looper, if I could ever get him here, he is, I mean, he, this love exudes from him. We've had him here once before. Those that were here during that conference, he is a pastor's, 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 pastor. And he has such a grace about him. I don't have that kind of grace. I just slap you upside the head and say, this is truth, okay? He doesn't, he says, now we just need to look at it. And he just kind of eases you in. I go, you know, he just tries to ease you in in such a pastoral way. And I, I have said and I have watched him and I just marvel. And I've had him, we, we're sitting here the, uh, during the conference in the break, and he opened his mouth and shared something for five minutes that, that eclipsed everything that was taught by even him during the conference. And I'm thinking, why was it the camera on you? <laughs> and yet I was at a conference when the God just began pouring out healing on ministers, and he was the most broken of all. He's even had family turn on him. The betrayal. He and Brother Gar, Dr. John Gar, you may have seen some of his books, were uh, both di um, bishops in a Sabbath-keeping, feast-keeping denomination. And they knew what God was getting ready to do. This is back in the 90s. They knew what God was getting ready to do how that he was going to expand it outside the borders of this group. And so they began saying, listen, we need to set things in order so that we can minister and help the body bring balance and all this. And, and uh, they didn't like that. They wanted it to be, you know, God bless us for no more Acts 2, 4, you know, whatever, you know. And uh, First Opinion 7, 19, and, 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 and tried to get this established. They waited 
especially Brother Gar. I mean, they they built a beautiful building down there. Several, you know, the, I don't know if it was worth a million or whatever. But it was a really really nice building. They waited for him to just basically almost kill himself for a couple of years to get it paid off because he was getting everything in position to do things. So. Dr. Looper and Dr. Gar go to, over to Israel. When they come back, the board had an emergency meeting, voted them out, locked them out of their own building, cut off their funds, and left them for bait. I can't imagine that after spending 30 years building something. And... Uh, Brother Gar even said that he found that one of the guys on the board that voted him out and, I mean, cuts off all your finances, everything, then turned around and tried to get his mortgage. And for Brother Looper, some of these people were family. How many know the Spirit of God wasn't in that? And you can replicate that over and over and over. And how many, no church split is ever caused by the Holy Spirit, caused by another spirit. There are more people hurt, I said this last week, there are more people hurt in churches than they are in bars. Why? We're not letting the Holy Spirit minister to us. We don't understand his ministry, and we're looking for some warm fuzzy or some esoteric mystical thing. And how many know the devil will give you mystical all day? He loves that because he could deceive you all day long. What God is interested in is in the day in, day out practical things. If you get those in order, you can do some other things, but you can't go and do calculus when you don't even know that two plus two equals four and nothing is adding up in your life and yet you want God to use you. He's got to heal you before he can use you. That's what this comforter is here. He took these 12 men that were the least likely that wouldn't stand up for anything hardly. And when he got through with him, they were willing to die for him. Now some of that came after the new birth. How I many know Peter at the crucifixion of Christ denied him three times? Why? Because just the teaching without the new birth took him as far as it could get him. But after he received salvation, he received that new birth. He said, when it came time to crucify him, he didn't try to get out of it. He said, I am not going to be crucified the same way as my Lord and demanded that they hang him upside down. Because he had no wise wanted to, they didn't want it to be Jesus plus Peter. I tell you what, that, 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 that is like going from Pee Wee Herman to a special forces. Right. Navy SEAL type of thing. Yeah. Because of what the Holy Spirit did in his life. Just with that little bit right there, do you think a lot of what's being done in the body of Christ today is the Holy Spirit? Or are people just like the, the, these, these, uh, the Illuminati and the, these, they, they worship these spirits and they send them forth to deceive the body. They know they've got to deceive the church. And one of the things that really interested me is they were talking about necromancy on, on talking to the dead. Do you know that we have, I've seen in several charismatic ministries uh, that we actually have people that are moving in the spirit and talking to the dead. That is forbidden in Scripture. That is, that, 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 that is a sin, and that is not your relative or, or, or King George or Napoleon or anything else. These demon spirits love to imitate them. There's something called familiar spirits. That means they're familiar with them. They can mimic them. They can say things that, uh, that only maybe that individual knows because they were hanging around the whole time they were doing it. And yet now we have charismatic movements. Well, let's begin. No, that's what the Illuminati do. But they know that they are fallen angels. People say, well, that's, that's not, that is not the Spirit of God. God is calling us to walk in balance. I want us to take, take a look at John 14, 16, and 18. I, I want to show you an interesting thing that Jesus said, and it's in the Greek this way, and I don't believe it was a translational fupa. I think it's exactly what Jesus was meaning because he was trying to convey something to them. 
John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Every time Jesus brings up this comforter, he's the spirit of truth. So if there's a spirit of error, how many know it's not the Holy Spirit? Whom the world cannot receive, because it uh, seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye knoweth him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I leave you not comfortless. Finish that sentence. I come to you. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit is Jesus, is Messiah. We don't serve a pantheon. We serve one God who has manifested himself as three witnesses in the earth. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God who has manifested himself. Jesus, when they said, show us the Father, Jesus said, here I am. What more do you want? I'm here. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it is Jesus. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is going to act just like Jesus did in the Gospels. If a spirit is acting other than the way that Jesus acted in the, in the Gospels, he is not the Holy Spirit. He is not the Ruach HaKodesh. He is another spirit that is leading into error. If you can't see Jesus doing it, if you can't see the Apostle Paul doing it, if you can't see Peter doing it, maybe, now this, this, now, this, this is this, maybe up for debate. If it's not in the Bible, maybe we shouldn't be doing it. Because there are a plethora of things that are spiritual, that are mystical, that all originate out of the occult. They will, uh, they will pump up the flesh. They will, they will convince you that the very wounds that God's trying to heal you of are gifts. Mary and I have said in, in a congregation before, and... This family, the, the guy needed help. The wife said, you know, the, he's just about destroyed my spiritual walk. Trying to function as a prophet, Brother Chuck. Now, one day he would give a, a good word. The next day, I mean, he just, he didn't go. <laughs> we had him actually give us a prophetic word that was right on how that the, the body of Christ is like this huge ship and it's about ready to sink because of storm, so you got to throw off all the stuff that doesn't really belong. And it was right on. Then he got mad at us when we started doing it. And so here we're trying to minister to them and have to deal with how he just about destroyed his wife's walk with God. And then he comes in after that and, says, and, and when he gets mad when we start throwing off all the junk, he says, well, God sent me here to correct you. And I'm thinking, surely there's somebody at least has their life together that God could see. You know, am, am I so low on, on God's order of things? He's got to send somebody worse off than me to come to correct me? I mean, I, guys, I got men in my life with the Restoration Fellowship International, that I would sit down. I mean, uh, I, I could name, Mary knows a lot of them. They, they, they've been through hell to get where they are. Paid a price that I know that I would, I would trust them with my very lives. Now, if they want to come, they can, they can read my mail. They can correct me. They say, Mike, you're preaching this, and this is what the Word says. And they're gonna, Quit it. I would heed it because I know their character. I know where they are with God. But God isn't going to send somebody that is a hundred times worse than I am to come to correct me. And how many pastors go through that over and over and over again? People that act like Daffy Duck in services, then they're here to correct the pastor. They're just all over. I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Oh, oh, oh. no, I'm going to do this. I even cringe when people say, I'm come to be your armor bearer. No. <laughs> if you get my armor off, you have a dagger, you'll stab me in the back. I've had that happen. <laughs> and last thing a pastor needs to do is worry about his armor bearer trying to kill him. Yeah, that's right. Bill, hand me a weapon. Then they hand you a stick of dynamite and it's already lit. How many know you got problems? <laughs> Jim, I need to. No. All because we don't let the Holy Spirit right. deal with us. Right. The first lie of the devil is God always gives you things for everybody else. If you don't apply it, 
You can't cry it. Everything Mary and I have ever shared from this pulpit is because we applied it in our own lives. We got corrected. Yeah, Daddy sat us down and said, boy, you got some explaining to do. <laughs> yes, sir. And when he corrects me and shows me that I should, a lot of times some of the, the deep things everybody gets so excited about here were birthed out of correction. I teach on the Sabbath because I got corrected. It wasn't because Michael Hick got some divine revelation. I was getting my head beat in by the devil, and I said, Daddy, and he said, I need to fix something, son. And he began to show us yeah. because it, it, caught, it, it was a, a hole in our hedge of protection that the devil had, had a five-lane highway he was running semis in and out of. And God says, how about putting the hedge of protection back? And then I find out the Illuminati are using Sunday worship to open up a spirit of deception to the body. And I think it's kind of working. I don't know about you. Now, let me tell you something. Us Sabbath keepers, we got our own mess of stew we got to deal with because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on with it. But if we just simply yield to God, yeah. let God correct and it's always going to line up with this thing. And I don't mean you got to look at it half cock, you know, you know, like this and take half of it here and stitch it in with this here. And a lot of, st always start. And this is one of the things I enjoy about the rabbis when, when they deal with, with uh, um, parodies, the, how to interpret the Torah, the four levels. No matter how deep you get, it's always got to match up with the plain truth of the Scripture. I don't care if you get into the soda level where it's all mystical. It better line up with the plain text. Otherwise, you're not dealing with God. God can take you deeper. But it's a deeper understanding of what's plain in plain sight. That is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. It's a continuation of the ministry of Jesus. Now, when the Holy Spirit begins working... We see the same thing that we see in people in the lives of those around Jesus. It is a slow, steady, balanced walk into holiness and to wholeness. In fact, I've realized many times some of the, the epiphanies I've had. You know, it can be an epiphany or it can be the Holy Spirit just kind of comes and meets you and does some things. We think he just kind of did it out of the blue. No. No. It was built upon the foundation of the things that he was already putting into place in my life that cultivated in that epiphany or cultivated in that breakthrough. And we have all been in services where, where people, there are people all around them getting breakthroughs and they're not getting anything. Do you ever see that? I mean, I, I have been in services, this where the Spirit of God is so strong, people are just crying. And then there's Bob. I don't feel nothing. Or Elmer. <laughs> we don't have any Elmers around here. Elmer's sitting there. I don't feel nothing. I don't, say, I don't know what everybody's crying about. <laughs> well, you didn't let God put the things, the pieces of the puzzle into your life to prepare you for what he was getting ready to do. I look back at all, all the things God has really done, and I can see his hand in preparing my heart. I can, I can Mike, let's, let's tweak you a little bit here. Let's get you to repent over here. Let me give you some understanding over here. And then there was a crescendo, and we call it a breakthrough. No, it wasn't. It's God gave me the dynamite to break the dam. He shows me where to dig the hole. He dig the hole. I light the fuse. And then when it explodes, it's a natural outcome of everything that was set into place. But what we want God to do is for God to show up, God to dig the hole, God to take the dynamite, God to light the fuse. And right before it goes off, he says, duck. You know? That's not the way God operates. Do you know why? If, see if this makes sense. How many of us have seen people that God supposedly did something in their lives and their answer is, just come to church, just come to this meeting, just come to this movement. Just come, maybe you'll get something too. That's because they didn't know that there were steps that led them there. 
And so you have people running for meeting to meeting, and I'm not against going against meetings. I, I, I do meetings. I love to go to meetings. But wouldn't it be a better thing saying, well, if you yield to God and let God show you this, and then, then won't you pray about that and come back and I'll show you the next step. And, and see, that's part of the testimony. If you can give them the same steps that God gave you to get there, they can get there too because God's not a respecter of persons. If one plus one always equals two, if you get them to do one plus one, they're always going to get the two. And it becomes a testimony. It becomes a blueprint. As the Holy Spirit begins working on me, it becomes a blueprint and a testimony that I can begin giving other people as they, as they receive that testimony of surrender to God. They can begin repl- re, you know, doing it in their lives. And instead, we have this, we have this conception that you know, God opens up a faucet underneath here. I've learned a lot from my chickens. They can be out pecking around. Mary comes out the door, and they just go, there might be some food. Isn't that what we do a lot with what we call revival or a lot with the charismatic move of revival? It's like God's playing games with us. I'm going to open up a spigot over here. Oh, I'm going to shut it off. I'm going to open up over here. I got the river that's supposed to be flowing out of me. And what I've got to do is submit to God to surrender to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then it begins to flow out of me. And if, if I do that right, and you do that right, when we gather here, it all begins to flow together. Have you ever, stu- ever understood the, how rivers work? You'll have many little tributaries, many little creeks flow together, and it begins to be a mighty rushing winter, a river. That's the way it works in the spirit, too. That as I begin to, it may just be a little creek, but I'm submitting to God, and I'm just seeking him. I'm letting him work in my life and doing the things he needs to do in my life. And Mary's doing the same thing. Bill's doing the same thing. Chuck's doing the same thing. Chad and Roma are doing the same thing. When we come together, all those little creeks make a river, and we call it a church service. That's the beauty of the way it's supposed to be when the body comes together. And instead, we got the water shut off here, and we're looking for God to open up a faucet someplace. And we make a little slogans, get out of the spout where the glory, you know, get out of the glory spout, you know, or well, however it goes. Or get out of the spout where the glory comes out, you know. We make all these little things. The, the spout's supposed to be right here. But what we literally have going on, Paul warned us about in Ephesians 4.14. He said that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Tossed to and fro. <laughs> and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. In maturity and not allowing the Holy Spirit to really minister to us the way that He wants to causes us to be all over the grid of life. Demonic spirits push our flesh. Our carnal minds chase after every new and mystical doctrine floating about in the body of Christ. It makes us succumb to deception of the crafty deceit of men's hearts. When men have their own agenda and they're trying to build something in the flesh. You know, all the things that are are being pushed about right now, about church growth, how to get church to grow, I don't do any of them. You know why? It's crafty deceit. A lot of it is. Well, we need to have visitation teams. You know, the first time somebody comes, then we show up with baked bread and cookies and all these different things and, and just all these, all these different things that, that, that they do, in a sense, can be ni- manipulation. I don't see Jesus ever doing that in the Gospels. The only time he gave bread... Is not a his staff even baked it. A little boy shared his lunch because everybody had, they, were, they wanted the truth so bad, they stayed beyond that which their bodies could endure. And he knew that they had a long way to walk to go home. It wasn't because Jesus had a bread and fish ministry. It was because people were so hungry with truth. If it doesn't start with truth, a desire for truth, the Holy Spirit can't work because he is the spirit of truth. I want us to look again at John 16, 8 through 11. And I, I, want to, I want to show you a pattern. 
How many know there are patterns in the Word of God? God gives us templates so that we can understand. And when He is come, He will reprove the word of sin, of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now what is that really meaning? I want to show you here, there's four things. Four things this does. He brings stability, he brings correction, he brings instruction, he brings empowerment. Is the job of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I want you to look at this. He reproves the world of sin. He brings correction. If the Holy Spirit can't do anything in your life, if you don't allow him to correct you. you he won't, he won't, he'll never do the other if he can't do this because you can't even get saved until he convicts you of sin. He brings correction. We've got to surrender to him. Correct me wherever I need to be corrected. Even if it's things I have done forever, and I thought it was right all these years, one day I had to stand up in, in the pulpit, it wasn't this one, it was the one down in Dixon, and say, I've been preaching the pre-trib rapture ever since I was 13. I was wrong. How many know that's kind of hard to do? Got several doctorates that qualify me to preach the pre trib rapture. <laughs> and I was wrong. I was wrong about this. God corrected me. I was wrong about this because I was going by what I had been taught, but it wasn't by the Holy Spirit. And God, and because of that correction, God sustained us over a lot of things. We, we, we switched from uh, Sunday worship to the Sabbath service. Those very things... Listen to this. When we, when we stopped doing Christmas and Easter and Sunday worship, started doing the feasts and starting doing Sabbath, Christians just thought we were weird, but the occult got extremely angry about it. It cut them off. They couldn't deceive anymore, and they couldn't attack anymore the way that they were used to doing. You see, Mary and I, from where we came from, we're an enigma because we're the only pastors they hadn't killed. that fought them. All the rest of them died in accidents, died of cancer, and they were braggadocious about it. And God, because God corrected us, it put up some armor. And God is, and I, that's why I rejoice in correction because I want my armor all on. I, I want the belt of truth holding it all together. And we have most believers entering into spiritual combat and either they, all they got on is a pair of boxer shorts, if they're lucky. Most of them end up going into battle wearing the clothing of Adam before the fall. Nothing. They don't even have a fig leaf. And then they wonder why the arrows so easily hit them. Well, Mike, are, are you there yet? No, still, God's still correcting me. Why? Because there's still things I've got to learn. There are things I've got to do just like there are things you've got to do. And I'm like all of you that I'm still, we, all of us try to overcome the past. Because all of us were wounded and hurt and different things by people that never dealt with their issues, thinking that it never went beyond themselves and it affected an entire another generation. Part of the problem with this generation is the past generation never took the time to deal with their issues. And what I want to be, I want to be a generation that deals with my issues so my kids don't have to. Because then they got to deal with mine plus theirs. Look at this. He reproves the world of sin. He brings correction of righteousness. And people don't understand it because of righteousness, because you don't see me no more. Jesus was righteousness personified. And so the Holy Spirit is to show us what righteous living is, just like Jesus walked it when he was here on the earth. And the only way that he can really do it is to get a people that he can bring correction and then begin bringing righteousness into. We're supposed to convict the world. Not because we're shaking a finger in their face, but because we're living the truth. You see, if we allow the Holy Spirit to correct us, he can bring righteousness. And if he begins to bring righteousness, he can bring judgment. 
He said, the prince of this world is already judged. Every time Jesus got someone set free from sin, Satan was judged in their lives. Every time he healed a sick body, Satan was judged in their lives. Every time we pray for someone and they get set free or we get a prayer answered because we're, the, as the Holy Spirit works on us and begins to produce righteous living, it empowers our prayer life. And every time we see a prayer answer, what Satan was trying to do in that situation gets judged by God and he is arrested and thrown out of that situation. That's why the Bible says Jesus went about doing good and healing all those oppressed of the devil. He was destroying the works of the devil. In every one of those situations, the devil was getting judged. And the only way that God can judge the prince of this world today is if he has a remnant that are being allow themselves to be corrected and allow themselves to begin walking in righteousness. And when you have correction and righteousness, you will have judgment. But how many know that if you've been corrected, the judgment's not supposed to be for you. It's supposed to be for the prince of this world and all those who align themselves with him. I want to see that. One, one of my prayers has been this week, Mary and I prayed this morning, God, activate the remnant. Activate the remnant. There may not be a bunch of us. You know, there's not a lot of us compared to a lot of the things that we see going on. But you know that this little crowd that's here today, if we would allow the Holy Spirit to really work in our lives to correct, to bring righteousness, and to begin bringing judgment, we could do in the spirit realm what a 20,000-member church couldn't do. That's, right. that's not walking in it. Yep. If two or more are gathered in my name, gathered in his character, gathered in his nature... I'm in the midst of them. Jesus is here. The storms get stilled. The sick get healed. The boats get stabilized. I'm not looking for crazy wildfire excitement that's of the flesh. I'm looking for stability. You see, when God's really moved, you just keep slowly. You're stable. You're not... <laughs> How many know more people have been turned, on by the, turned off by the gospel by the Daffy Ducks in the kingdom? Yep. Are those with a religious spirit? Oh, it's you. I've seen them do that with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Guys, I've seen them do that with the Hebraic heritage. I have seen people with a religious spirit that share the truth of the feast and of the, and of the Sabbath in such an arrogant way that a fence post would be offended. You just did the devil's work. You really did. Because maybe God was wanting to introduce them to some things and you shared it so offensively that for sure they're not going to do it because they're going to say God wasn't in that anywhere. How many know the Holy Ghost wants to fix that? The Holy Spirit wants to fix that. We're supposed to share the truth with each other in meekness, in humility. The devil's character is to puff up and to be prideful and to be arrogant. And if you ever see that going on, it's not the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm, I constantly ask God to, to deal with me because I know that I have the propensity, like I've shared with you, I have the propensity, not, not trying to be arrogant, but I have the propensity, I can phrase the right thing and say it the wrong way. I will, it, it, it is a bloodline genetic <laughs> defect, yeah, that I've got to work on because I never want to make you offended by the truth that I'm trying to share. I constantly got to work on Mike. Like I, I'll go through the things I want to say a thousand times in my head during the week. I need to get Mike Lake stupid out of the way so that the Holy Ghost brilliance can shine through. Because I know me. I mean, I, guys, I even do that in arguments. Mary, I'll share this with you. There, there, there are people when they get arguments, they know the right thing to share to... To, to get their, their point across. I don't. 
I can't. Sometimes I feel like Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you're a poop head, you know. That's, that's about it. Because it, it, when, when, I, when I kick into this natural mic like it, it's just not there. And my only resort is to, to try to share something that might be hurtful. You know, like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I won't do that. I've, I've had enough of that in my life. Guys, we, we, we need to, we got to have this Holy Spirit ministering to us this way in our lives. We, we got to stop making other people carry our loads and be wounded by what we're doing. Because we're supposed to be peacemakers. We're supposed to be the ones who, who and that, that's not talking about being no conflict. That's talking about being those that can produce the shalom of God, the, the healing, the, the peace of God. If we get this and get it right and completely surrender, you can't keep from getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a natural process of yielding. Nobody's got to prime the pump. Nobody's got to say, you know, I mean, let me, Rondi Shondi. And I'll say, Rondi Shondi. Well, you got it. No, you don't. You can't. Do the things in the flesh and expect it to be of the Spirit. It's when you surrender. And for some people, the hardest thing is for God to get a hold of their tongue. Come on. The devil's been using it for so long, it's like a doormat to him. And we don't get our life cleaned up, and we expect the Holy Spirit to take it over. He said, I'm going to touch that thing. <laughs> We're going to have to put some blood of Jesus over it and some healing and, and cleanse that thing. Stick it in the river for a while, would you? Whew. It's a bad even a search won't do, you know. I'm serious. And then people so long are seeking a manifestation they can't get to because they'll never surrender. And a lot of the conflict, a lot of the, the seeking of tearing for the Holy Spirit is the process of you surrendering. When you get to 100% surrender, the power comes. The prayer language comes. But we've never been taught to surrender. We've been taught, well, to seek the tongue, to seek, how do you get the tongue? I don't know. Say this phrase fast five times. Peter Piper, peck, peck, you know. <laughs> you know. Come on. You say it fast enough, it all blurs, then you get the, you get the Holy Ghost. Well, what, what, we, what we have are a lot of people that all they got is a motorboat. They're just like the kids out there playing with Hot Wheels, you know. They're, they're thinking they're doing something because they have never, ever surrendered. The minute... The Holy Spirit begins working in your life. The first thing he does is start to bring stability. As you repent, he st all your chaos begins to slow down. It begins to settle down because if you're in a state of chaos, you can't receive righteousness. You can't receive righteous instruction. You can't receive it. You're too busy bouncing from wall to wall and all over the place. You see, what, what I want to see and what, what, what brings me joy is, is, is not their crescendos. It is the study growth. The, all of a sudden, they start becoming the same. They start getting free and staying free. Things don't rattle them. They're not all over the map. They're not all over the grid. And God just, you know, and, and when you talk to them, it's, let me, let me show you what, you know, some things God corrects you in your life. You don't necessarily want to share, <laughs> you know. It isn't for public consumption for some of us. I mean, they're the most intimate things. But there's a lot of things that we can share. So, so when you begin talking, and this is how I know when God's really working, really, really working. When I go to ministries and they start telling me how the Holy Spirit's brought correction, how the Holy Spirit's lined things out, instead of, well, we, we built this and we've built this and we're doing this. Yeah, but what God, what, what's God doing? What's God doing? 
Well, we had this family that, that, that were domestic violence and they were so abusive. And God's brought such love and such peace to that family. Oh, Brother Mike, you just don't know what a wonderful thing it was when we saw the husband who used to be so abusive getting right before God at the altar. And it wasn't one of these pretend things. He'd be, he would be quick to repent. He, he'd catch himself getting angry and say, kids, why don't you pray for me? He'd catch himself before. See, that, that's God bringing stability. And as God starts bringing stability, it brings not only wholeness to him, but it brings wholeness to his family. That's what I'm looking for. That's what God wants to do in your lives. And the further along you get, the more stable you get. The more sane you get. You know, Mary and I, we have our ups and downs. We have some rough weeks. We have some rough days. But it's like a bobber, you know, sucked down out of the water, but it, it, it comes right back up. We'll, 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 we'll get hit. We'll, we'll shake ourselves and, and pray a little bit, and we'll come right back up to where God has us. Well, how do you get to the next level? You've got to raise the water. That's going to hit somebody here in a minute. You've got to raise the water. You've got to raise the water level of surrender to the Holy Spirit, of instruction from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Once you raise that, he takes you up with it. That's the true ministry of the Holy Spirit. Then you have something called a testimony. Folks, don't ever share. Come to church and be Daffy Duck like me. Don't, don't, don't do that. It's, you want your family to get whole? Let me show you what, what God's done. Now, we do it in this fellowship, and you don't necessarily have to be here because it's not about fellowships. It's about your personal walk with God. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender to the Messiah. Begin letting the Holy Spirit bring correction to your life and begin showing you the purpose of his commandments, showing the purpose of his instruction to produce righteousness to you. And if you begin, if you begin going that road, going that route of that walk with God, that path to dwell in, it will always lead to empowerment with God. It will always lead to greater things. It will always lead to that promotion. It will always lead to that healed marriage. It will always, it will always yield to that healed body. It will always get you there if you surrender and let him work. You see, that's, that's more personal. That's not coming and wanting God to do his whammy on you because that's where the glory's falling out and that's where God turned on this mystical faucet somewhere. And I don't say that God doesn't necessarily move like that. There are spots that God moves, but what I have found, if they don't allow the Holy Spirit to do this, they'll always end up right back where they were. You know, the mad man of Gadara meets Jesus, and then six years later, he's back in the graveyard again. I've seen a lot of believers do that because they never yield to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Father God, this morning, Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I ask that you would give us grace to see Jesus in the Holy Spirit, that you would give us the grace to begin letting go and surrendering Holy Spirit, right now, over this congregation and over everybody, whoever listens to this video, I ask that you would truly enter into your ministry of reproving, of instruction in righteousness, and in judging the enemy through their lives. It's got to be in that order. There's no way to circumvent that. We have got to be convicted, corrected, instructed, begin walking it. And as we do that, the enemy will always be judged by God in our lives. Father, my petition in heaven. Father, everyone here comes into agreement with it, that this is your way of the kingdom. Father, we ask that you would bring it to pass in our lives. And Father, I loose the anointing of the Holy Spirit to begin placing us on that journey. I believe this week we are going to get corrected. And Father, we know that the Holy Spirit doesn't do it abusively. He doesn't do it abrasively. He does it with such grace and such finesse that it's almost beyond our understanding. Because He loves us. He's called to comfort us by getting us to the place to be free. Oh. Father, please loose it in our lives. The times ahead demand it. We need to see the enemy judged. Yes. We need to see him judged. 
bring correction, bring righteousness, and we will see the judgment of God on the prince of this world. Father, I thank you, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name.